So during the keynote this morning, when we were getting kind of the update from the, the people at Apache Stratos, they were talking about that, that bottom layer that talks to the different infrastructure as a service clouds. And they had CloudStack and OpenStack and EC2 and, and whatever else listed there. So that's actually powered by JClouds. Um, they've been involved in our community for a little while now, and they've made some contributions. And we know that they're actually using Apache JClouds for that layer at the bottom that lets them talk to all the different clouds out there. So hi there, my name is Everett Taves. I'm a developer advocate in the developer relations group at Rackspace. Rackspace is an infrastructure as a service company. We provide cloud hosting. We also have a lot of services around cloud hosting. And I still get asked uh, quite often, what is a developer advocate? So I'd like to take just a moment to say what it is I do. So first and foremost, I am a developer. I am an engineer. I spend the majority of my time doing development in one form or another, whether it's working on JClouds or, or any aspect around JClouds working kind of in the JClouds ecosystem. So I'm a project management committee member and committer on Apache JClouds. And I have been for just about two and a half years now. I've been part of the transition from just JClouds as an open source project into the Apache Software Foundation. So I went through the whole incubation process and you know, eventually became a top level project here at Apache. And that was, that was really interesting, really great. Uh, the advocate part of the job is you know, the guy doing the song and dance before you today. I try to get out into the community, try to grow our community, and get feedback from people. I, I really like the term advocacy as opposed to uh, evangelism because it's a two-way street. Not only am I advocating for JClouds and Rackspace and OpenStack and, and whatever else, but I also want to hear from our users, from our developers. I want to advocate for the people who are actually using JClouds in their day-to-day -day development. What problems do you have with JClouds? What challenges do you face? How could it be better? And I want to take that feedback in and try to make JClouds a better project for developers. And this is me on the various GitHubs and Twitters and, and wherever else. I've also done some operations in my time. I actually built the first OpenStack cloud in Canada with one region in Alberta and one region in Quebec connected by a high-speed research network. That was a really interesting project. We did that about, <laughs> it's like four or five years ago now. And to that end, I'm co-author of this book, The OpenStack Operations Guide, which is about to be published by O'Reilly. You can actually download the thing for free at this URL here, and I'll be sharing out the slides later on. OK, so. What are we talking about today? Just to set the stage and give us all a, a common foundation of understanding, what cloud flavor is it that we're talking about today? So cloud comes in many flavors. There's software as a service, platform as a service, et cetera as a service, and infrastructure as a service. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today with respect to JClouds, using infrastructure as a service via JClouds. Also, you can use it with you know, private clouds, private infrastructure as a service. And to kind of give you a feel of exactly what it is you're responsible for when you're adopting these various flavors of cloud, just to kind of make sure we know exactly what we're responsible for, going towards the left, you're responsible for a whole lot more. You have applications, runtime security databases, when you're working with infrastructure as a service, amongst many other things. And for private, you've really got the whole smorgasbord. And the trade-off is you get more control as you go to the left, as you're working with the infrastructure pieces. But really, for our purposes today, the point that we're most interested in is that we're using infrastructure via an interface, whether it's you know, the raw HTTP interface communicating 
in some RESTful interface or, or what have you, or you're using an SDK, a software development kit like JClouds, or a CLI, or some sort of web interface. Doesn't matter, you're communicating with you know, the raw fundamental building blocks of computing, the infrastructure via an application programming interface. So some examples of these infrastructure as a service clouds. On the private side, you know, there's OpenStack itself, and of course, CloudStack. For public implementations of OpenStack, you have public clouds like Rackspace and HP. Of course, there's Amazon, very much a pioneer in the, the public cloud field. Microsoft Azure and Google Compute Engine. Well, wow, their whole suite of cloud products from Google. So multi-cloud, you know, why would you go multi-cloud? What's, what's the whole point of thinking about using multiple different clouds? I mean, we've all been kind of trained to think in, in platform agnostic ways, right? Uh, especially with respect to Java or really any of, any of the, the programming languages these days. You should be able to run it on any operating system. You're doing your development on a Mac, you're running it on Ubuntu in the cloud, or you're doing your development on Windows and you're running it on CentOS in the cloud, or what have you. So we have all been trained to think in these kinds of abstract ways so that we're not tied down to one particular platform. So there's this notion of application portability that you should be able to take your application and not only deploy it to different clouds that I was talking about before, whether it's public or private, you know, you might have this kind of hybrid scenario. So you need code that can actually start up your application architectures in various different clouds. The applications that are actually running within those clouds you might want to be able to port those to different clouds as well. So if you've got an application running on EC2, you might want to be able to port it over to HP. But why? You know, what, what are some of the reasons that we really want to do this sort of thing? You could consider it a form of high availability. If one cloud goes down, clouds have been known to have some um, outages, shall we say, at less than opportune points in time. So if a cloud goes down, it would be extremely useful to be able to start up your application in another cloud, or even have it running in parallel in another cloud. And you can repoint your DNS or your load balancers or, or whatever, and continue with your uptime. If the privacy policies and CLAs and whatnot of the cloud you're using kind of change out from under your feet, or you don't feel that you can trust the cloud that you're on today, you might want to consider porting your application to another cloud for tomorrow. Cost, uh, cost can be a real, have a huge impact on where it is you run your applications. You know, it's, it's often the case that it's very easy to get started in the cloud, but when you start running more and more and you know, getting married to a particular cloud provider, those bills that start arriving monthly can be pretty shocking, really. So if the costs of running on a particular cloud start to get too high, you might want to consider a different cloud provider or even a private cloud. You've reached that scale that your application or your infrastructure is running at, that you, it actually makes more sense to buy your own gear, run your own private cloud. So you need to be able to port your application to that cloud. Performance characteristics. I mean, we're all constantly concerned about the performance of our applications. If the cloud provider you're on is not giving you the performance you need to run your application and be responsive to your users, you're gonna to want to possibly port it to a different provider. If you're not getting the support you need in a particular cloud, it could be that you don't have the in-house expertise available to you, you know, quickly and easily, that you can do all the, I'm gonna say it, devops -y things that you need to do to run in a cloud environment. So you might choose a different cloud provider 
with better support, who can give you those skills that you need to get running in the cloud. And then I kind of hinted at it before, this, this hybrid scenario where you're, you might have a private cloud running kind of a, a base, your, your base um, application, you know, the base load is what I'm trying to say, for your application. But when you get a spike in demand for your application, you know, you might want to burst out into a public cloud, get those extra resources you need for that time. This is the whole owning the base and renting the peak scenario, this hybrid scenario where you can get the resources you need on demand. And so your application has to be portable between your private cloud and the public cloud that you're bursting out into. So really, I mean, it all kind of boils down to one size does not fit all. If you've got your application running in one place today, that might not be the most, make the most sense for where it should be running tomorrow. And not every cloud provider is the same. So you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You want to avoid lock-in. Again, something we've all been kind of trained to do, you know, from the start of doing our development. Abstract things out, avoid lock-in. That's basically the advantage of cloud portability, of being able to move your applications from one cloud to another. And how do we do this, do you ask? Well, here's the introduction to Apache JClouds. So again, I'm a committer on JClouds. JClouds is the Java SDK for Rackspace and OpenStack. And here's our mission statement. I'm not going to read it to you, but I will leave it up there for it to be read. We've actually changed our mission statement recently in the past as we did the redesign of our website. We felt it was time to kind of freshen up the mission statement and let people know that you know, there's kind of this duality in JClouds where you can use the abstractions that work across all different clouds. And you can use the cloud-specific features of each of those clouds. Of course, we're open source. We're an Apache, Apache license. I think that's pretty apparent. It's a Java project, hence the J in front of J clouds. We've also got a closure interface, uh, a native closure interface for the abstractions in J clouds. And of course, you can use it with Groovy and Scala and, and all the different languages that do run on the JVM. Of course, it's a multi-cloud toolkit. And I'll get into the specifics of exactly actually which clouds we do support. Now, talking about some of the concepts, some of the kind of the core concepts in J clouds, the kind of things that, that really help you to understand what J clouds is and how you go about using it. It helps to understand these higher level concepts first. So there's this notion of APIs in J clouds. And what are they? So we have APIs for many, 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 many things. But here's just a, a small sample. You know, the, the EC2 API, the S3 API, CloudStack, the OpenStack APIs for compute and object storage and queues, and the VMware vCloud API. So the APIs are slightly more abstract. They're, they're just the APIs for all of these different things. Then we have the actual providers, the data centers, the public cloud providers who actually deliver these services to you, that infrastructure as a service to you. So there's, we've kind of split the concepts of API from the people who are actually delivering that service to you. These are two separate concepts. So when it comes to something like the EC2 API, AWS provides that API, but Eucalyptus, the private cloud kind of implementation of EC2, also provides that API. Likewise, with the OpenStack APIs, there's the HP implementation of it, there's the Rackspace implementation of it. And really, those are just kind of thin wrappers 
these providers are the thin wrappers around the APIs. They just add some configuration. They add the endpoints, you know, for Rackspace or HP. And they just make it a little bit easier to use for the developers who are actually taking advantage of JClouds. So that's the APIs and that, the providers, the providers that implement the APIs. So then on top of those are built the portable APIs. So this is actually the interface name that you would use within JClouds to access the abstraction layer that can talk to the various compute APIs from all the different providers. It's called compute service. So which APIs actually support the compute service? Which APIs actually plug into the compute service so that when you call create VM, create nodes, it's actually called in JClouds in the, the interface, which clouds can actually run that command? And it's a whole host of them, and there's, there's many more than this. And there's more being added every day. OK, every day might be. Uh, uh, a bit of an exaggeration. For the object storage, we've got the blob store API. So this is the name of the interface that abstracts all of the different kinds of object storage around that you find in the, the various different cloud providers. So a sample of some of the providers that implement the blob store API. This is uh, one where, you know, uh, for Microsoft, we have their Blob Store API implemented, but we don't have their Compute API implemented. And if there's any from anyone from Microsoft here, it would be great to, to see that contributed to JClouds. Okay, so we've got these portable APIs, and it's this abstraction layer that lets you use the same interface calls that run across the different cloud providers. You run create nodes, and it can work on Rackspace, HP, EC2, Google Compute Engine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But really, these portable APIs are no silver bullet for what it is you want to do in the cloud. I want to make this really clear, because this isn't quite it's definitely not right once, run anywhere. And I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thing with Java. We've all written Java that's supposed to be right once, run anywhere, but you try to run it somewhere, and it crashes horribly and miserably because of some, you know, platform-specific thing that you weren't really aware of. And then you code it in there, and then it starts working again. But really, it's using these portable APIs there's no silver bullet, it's no panacea. Unless it really works for your use case, you know, because it can be really, really difficult depending on your use case as to what it is you need out of these portable APIs. The differences across the, the providers can be quite a bit depending on exactly what kind of feature you're working with whether it's compute or object storage or queues or databases or what have you, it can be tough to abstract out these things. And I was in the, the Cordova talk just before this, and you know, of course, they run into a lot of the same kinds of things where they just they can't build abstractions for every little thing because they're just too different. Some of the features are just too different, and it just doesn't make sense to build abstractions for those things. So it can be really, really difficult to create these portable APIs because you don't have those common features. You don't have that common behavior. So what can you do about it? If you want to create a portable application, you have to consider these different common behaviors, these common APIs, all of these, and all of the differences across the providers. So if that works for your use case, then it works really well if it makes sense for your use case, if you can create it for your use case. A good example is Maginatics. 
they have this MAGFS, and it runs across many different blob store providers, all using JClouds. And so you can install it on your machine and use it like your file system, and it can store blobs, objects, files, whatever, in all sorts of different blob stores across all sorts of different clouds. But if that doesn't work for you, if you're, that isn't your use case, then JClouds can ease your application migration. So if you're not using the portable APIs, you can use the cloud-specific features from AWS or Rackspace or HP or whoever. And if you need to change, if you need to port your application to a different cloud, you can keep using JClouds to do that. You don't need to adopt another SDK. You can ease your application migration by staying within JClouds. You don't have to take another SDK and understand its idioms and all its little nuances and all the different things that you need to know. You can take that knowledge that you've earned, that hard-earned knowledge that you've got and experienced from using JClouds and port that to the new cloud. You keep using the different cloud-specific APIs, but now you're staying within JClouds. You don't have to switch from the Google SDK to the AWS SDK. You just stay within JClouds, and you use that hard-won hard knowledge and port that across. So not only can you use the portable APIs, that abstraction layer, you can ease application migration from one cloud to, the, to another. So just to reiterate, again, it all depends on your use case. If your use case is covered by the portable APIs, that's great, perfect, use the portable APIs. But you're not restricted to using those APIs to take advantage of JClouds. So thank you very much for sticking with me so far. I'd like to take a bad slide break here. This is a terrible slide. I mean, it starts with Comic Sans. It's got text, a joke that's obscured by other images, outdated memes, blinking text. This is an awful slide. This is actually me back when I was living in Canada. I'm, I'm based out of Austin now. Uh, one of our years of almost record snowfall, uh, and we're just out hanging out in the backyard. Uh, I wish the, I've got the audio plugged in here, but it's not working, I guess. Uh, you can hear my kids laughing their heads off at my stupidity. Okay, anyway. So, talking about, a bit about the JClouds community. So, we've got a ton of users. We have a lot of people depending on JClouds. JClouds was actually started by Adrian Cole. Uh, it's really kind of a neat story. About four years ago, he was working in London and his contract expired and he put his backpack on and started backpacking through Europe, talking to various cloud providers, talking to user groups, and he built this open source project known as JClouds. And eventually, you know, he's, he's kind of tr transitioned and moved on. And so one of the things he did was put us into the Apache Software Foundation so that, you know, we reduce the bus factor. So used by many people, of course, as I said, it's, it's the Rackspace Java SDK, but really we, we just take vanilla JClouds. We don't even rebrand it or anything. It's just JClouds. It's also used by HP as their Java SDK. Um, I don't suppose Chris is in the room today? Okay, I'll be meeting Chris later. He's uh, a gentleman from, who's gonna be working with HP on JClouds, helping them getting it back up to speed with their new implementation of OpenStack. And of course, uh, it wouldn't be uh, open source talk if I didn't ask uh, you here in the audience to think about contributing to JClouds or even just using JClouds. Either way, you know, we would love to have you. So here are some of the top contributors today of JClouds. Uh, Abico is actually a company in Spain running a cloud out there. Uh, Cloudera, a major sponsor of ApacheCon. CloudSoft, Maginatics, Rackspace, CB Labs, 
all of these people contributing code, doing releases, just contributing time in the mailing lists and IRC. However it is that people can contribute, they do. It's great. And you can go to our website here and check out our community page if you want to get involved. OK, so architecturally speaking, where does JClouds actually live? You know, where is its home in relation to the system that you're building, your system? So typically, if you were building a system and you wanted to talk to some cloud API, you might do this. You might talk to it from you know, your application directly, making the HTTP calls. You don't want to do that. It's a bad idea for a whole bunch of reasons that I'll get into. You want to use JClouds, of course, right? And if your cloud was actually deployed in the, if your system was actually deployed, deployed in the cloud, then nothing really much changes. You still have JClouds as a dependency of your system, you know, the series of jars that you need for it, and it still talks to the same API, and you don't really have to change anything. So what can JClouds do for you? What are the, all the various benefits of actually using JClouds? So we're not quite as uh, flexible as this guy, uh, although we do have uh, a plugin for him. Um, but we do a lot of stuff. We do a lot of the plumbing for you when it comes to talking to cloud APIs. Just marshalling and unmarshalling the bodies of HTTP requests and responses, actually building up the URL to talk to the various resources in the cloud APIs. There's just a whole lot of plumbing in there that you don't have to do. You just call methods and you get objects back as a result from working with the various clouds that you need to work with. It handles authentication for you. This can always be kind of a sticky thing, especially when you're talking about working with many different cloud providers. It also handles re-authentication for you. There are some cloud providers out there, uh, like the OpenStack-based ones, where you get a token back when you authenticate, and that token expires after a period of X amount of hours. But when that expiration happens, you get a 401, and you simply re-authenticate. And JClouds handles that for you automatically. It helps you with paginating large result sets. It helps you with state polling. It's a simple matter of fact that when you're working with resources in the cloud, they're not ready when you ask for them always, especially when you're setting up something like a VM. It's a matter of simply pulling that resource for its state to see if it's ready, to see if it's active, and you can actually start working for it, working with it. It helps you with rate limiting. Most cloud providers implement some form of rate limiting where if you're making too many requests to the API, they will cut you off, they will suspend your account for some period of time, and that really sucks. If your account gets suspended, you're hosed for a little while, your whole system could go down because you're depending on that API, you're depending on that cloud. So JClouds just makes it easy to configure how often you call out to the cloud when you're doing stuff like state polling. Errors are a fact of life, especially network errors. You might have some sort of transient network error. So JClouds will retry for you some configurable amount of times before actually kicking that error back to the user, back to the application code, and where you have to deal with it then and there. It smooths a lot of the rough edges across some of those APIs. Uh, if you've ever called out directly to some of the cloud APIs, uh, they come in a variety of cleanliness, and I've started to rate cloud APIs uh, on the effect they have on my marriage. Um, there's been a lot of late nights, uh, a lot of frustrated Everett's uh, who get extremely angry at some of the dumb APIs and some of the dumb things that the APIs do. So I've taken that pain, and hopefully uh, no one else will ever have to take that kind of pain again. Hopefully, I've been able to smooth over some of those rough edges and made things easier for the developers using JClouds. It's packaged in Maven, so you can just get it with a POM file or via Ivy or Gradle or whatever build system you're using. It's in Maven Central, and it's easy to fetch. It contains all of the various APIs that are 
currently supported and there's more being added constantly. So you don't have to go out and get another SDK every time you want to use a new feature of some cloud that you want to take advantage of. So ultimately, what do you get with something like JClouds? You get production-ready code. JClouds has been around for four years. It's been kicked around a whole lot. Uh, it's got an extensive uh, list of issues in JIRA, and we're working on those all the time. We're improving it. We're finding bugs. We're fixing them. You get a lot of sample code with JClouds. To work with the portable APIs, there's a lot of, of examples for that stuff. There's also a lot of examples specifically for Rackspace. That's something that I've been working on and prioritize very highly because I want to make it easier for developers to get started with JClouds doing some particular task that they need to accomplish in the cloud. And of course, documentation. And I'm actually going to be speaking a bit more about this tomorrow in my session on how to enable walk-up contributions to your project documentation. And so this is something we've prioritized as well. We want to make it really easy to get started with JClouds. And if there are any issues, any bumps or barriers you find when you're trying to get started with JClouds, I would love to hear about it. When it comes to using JClouds, because it's an abstraction library, there are some differences in terminology between what JClouds talks about and what all of the other clouds talk about. We had to get some abstract terminology, right? So in JCloud's land, they call it a node, whereas you know, in some of the various other clouds, it's an instance or a server or a VM or what have you. Then there's location. In JCloud's, it's called, or in, in other clouds, it's called a region or a zone, depending on you know, what kind of scope it has. Hardware, node metadata, user metadata, all these different things where it's kind of easy to get tripped up when you're getting started with JClouds with these kind of abstract terms when you're so used to using the terms of one particular cloud provider. Okay, so I'm gonna do a quick demo now. Fingers crossed. Um, demo is short for demolition, right? That's that it? Okay, well hopefully this, this works okay and, and goes relatively smoothly. So I'm just gonna start by going to jclouds.apache.com like anyone else would do. And we just recently revamped our website. We're all very bootstrappy now, and it's, it's much nicer than it was before. Before, it kind of looked like a tombstone, actually, uh, was what I likened it to. And we've uh, put a fair amount of effort into creating something that's a bit nicer and hopefully a better experience for developers. So we want to install JClouds. We're going to skip straight to this. And kind of the default way to install JClouds is with Maven using a POM XML file. Is everyone here familiar with Maven? Yeah, most, yeah. One of the advantages of being at ApacheCon. So I'm going to make a directory for Can, can the people in the back see that okay? Is that all right? Okay, great. I'm gonna make a directory just to house all of this stuff. And I'm gonna create this palm XML file. Okay, so what's next? So if, if you were just you know, putting this into your idea project or your Eclipse project or whatever, that would kind of handle everything for you. I'm gonna run this demo from the command line. So we need to grab the jar files using Maven itself. And I'm gonna put them in a different directory. So that happened extremely quickly because jclouds171 is already cached on my local machine here. Obviously if it wasn't, it would take a little longer to download. Okay, so now we have jclouds. It's effectively installed, right? We've got all the jar files that we need for working with all the different things in jclouds. Um, this, this palm XML file here just brings in absolutely everything 
you can actually be much more specific about it. You can kind of pick exactly what it is you need. Uh, I'm using this provider and that provider. You know, I'm only using um, object storage and compute and queues, so I'll, I'll just specify the particular dependencies for those things. And you specify those things in your POM XML file, and it'll only bring in those files and all of the transitive dependencies. Okay, so let's actually do something with it. So if I'm a developer, I'm looking to be guided, I'm gonna go to one of the user guides. And of course, I'm gonna run this on Rackspace here. Let me increase the size of that. Okay, so blah, 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 just a bit of an introduction here get a username and API key. So of course I already have one. I've got my, my test account on the Rackspace cloud. We can actually get one really easily too. If you go to this link here, you can sign up for the developer trial where you get $50 per month for six months. And it just gives you a chance to kick the tires on an OpenStack-based cloud. So get jclouds. Uh, we've already actually done this. We've got all the different jar files, all the different dependencies that we need to run jclouds, so we don't need to do this again. This was the command that I actually ran earlier. Again, with the terminology, just a quick explanation of the difference between the two. So we're actually gonna do our first Cloud Files app, and Cloud Files is the object storage solution based on OpenStack Swift that Rackspace uses to let people store any kind of digital assets that they need to in the cloud. And it's also got uh, a content delivery network associated with it, so you can make those files accessible to anybody in the world really easily with hopefully low latency as it's fetching those things from their edge servers. So just a bit more jargon. So let's get down to the source code here and actually bringing in one of the examples that I was talking about earlier. So we're gonna create this directory for some of our, one of our examples, the Cloud Files example. And we wanna create a file called Cloud Files Publish. And we're going to copy in this source code here. So with the way it appears here, it's probably not too legible, but I do wanna throw in some secret sauce. And back to our instructions here. We're gonna create a file called constants. Good old constants. Copy this in. I'm just gonna set the container name slightly differently. Okay, so now that we've got our source files for our example, we need to go ahead and compile them, of course. Now we'll see if I've made any uh, fat finger mistakes. Awesome. And now we go ahead and run them. So here, we'll be using my Rackspace username and API key. And this is exactly what you would get by signing up for the developer trial. So what we're doing here is, from my laptop, we're sending up a file out into 
the Rackspace cloud files, our object storage solution, and then we're flipping a bit on it and enabling it for content distribution. So that puts it on our content distribution network and makes it accessible to anyone in the world at, at the URL you see there. It's pretty easy to map uh, a DNS name, a domain name, to one of these containers. So you don't have to look at the ugly, ugly CDN um, raw name for it. So let's have a look, see at what we did. Hopefully it works. Hello, ApacheCon. And we could warm ourselves by the fire for the rest of the presentation, which is almost over. OK. So that was the demo, very quick, just storing an object in a cloud files, pretty basic. And that was using kind of a combination of the portable API, the blob store API, and the Swift API. Because in JClouds, you can actually, from the portable APIs, you can extract out the specific implementation of that. You know, once you instantiate your, your interface, you know, the blob store interface, you can actually step down a level and use some of the cloud-specific stuff from that API. And all of the, the rest of these slides here are just just for reference when I, when I post this on SlideShare or, or wherever Apache, uh, ApacheCon is going to post these things. Uh, like I was saying before, you can just get a subset of the jars, just the stuff you're using. So what's next for Apache JClouds? Well, here's a little potpourri. There's kind of a whole ecosystem of things built around JClouds. Uh, we've got a command line face powered by Carafe. Um, I haven't actually used it too much. Uh, there's a Jenkins plugin that lets you start slaves on any cloud. I just actually uh, submitted my first patch to that plugin on Friday. Uh, and, you know, it lets you start up slaves anywhere. There's JCloud Chef. It's just uh, kind of a little corollary project to JClouds that gets you started with Chef a little bit quicker, a little bit faster, a little bit easier. You know, because you can use JClouds to start up virtual machines and everything, but you're not going to use JClouds to manage those machines in the long term. You're going to want to use a Chef or a Puppet or a Salt or what have you to actually manage those things long term. And JCloud Chef helps you get started doing that with Chef and JClouds just a little bit quicker. And then, of course, there's all the different examples that you can check out from our GitHub repository. OK, so what's kind of next for JClouds? We're seriously considering dropping support. When I say dropping support, I mean just moving on to Java 1.7. Can I get a quick poll here? How many of your Java projects, if you're a part of one, still support Java 1.6? Yeah, and how many of you are thinking how badly you would like to just move on from 1.6 and forget it ever happened? Yeah, um, it, it's a tough one though because it's just so pervasive. So many of the enterprises just haven't moved on. But I mean, really, it's it's end of life, and it's just so many so many bugs that it's gotten such a bad reputation, and it's just strictly from all the applet stuff, which is a kind of a crying shame. But anyway, it's got so many problems, and it's time to move on. We're de-asyncing some of our, our interfaces. We're actually de-asyncing all of our interfaces, I should say. Uh, originally, JClouds was written where you could get a synchronous or asynchronous interface back. And if you got the asynchronous interface back when you called those methods, you would simply get a future back from those methods. And so JClouds had this whole threading model baked right into it, but we found that you know, you can't dictate a threading model for clients. They're always going to want to do something different. It's never going to be quite right for them. And it also caused a lot of confusion, confusion for new people coming to JClouds. You know, do I use sync? Do I use async? How does it work? Can I tweak it? Can I this? Can I that? And it was, you know, it was always like this when people came to JClouds for the first time with respect to using the, the sync and async interfaces. 
So we're looking at deasyncing all of the different interfaces so that people just use the sync interfaces. And if they want multi-threading, they can do that themselves and get it right. Uh, we've got a Docker interface uh, is being contributed. It's currently in a pull request right now. And it's being reviewed. And that'll be in one of the, the future versions of JClouds. So you'll be able to control containers from JClouds, which is pretty cool. 172 is literally baking right now. Uh, I saw the, the, the code freeze email came out. They're going to be releasing it sometime today. Or I should say the vote for it to be released is going to start sometime today. So 172 will be out by the end of the week. And we release about every six weeks or so. So that brings us to the end. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my introduction about JClouds. I uh, just want to draw your attention to a couple other sessions. There is Taming the Cloud Database with Apache JClouds tomorrow at 10.30 AM from Zach Shoylev over here, one of my colleagues at Rackspace. And I'm also speaking again tomorrow in the afternoon about enabling walk-up contributions to project documentation. So this is how JClouds takes in contributions, how people can change the documentation on our website strictly from within their web browser. So again, thank you very much. And have a great rest of the conference. I'll take questions now, if you like. Over here. I don't see why you couldn't fire up anything you want. Yeah. Yeah, so a test app instance. That might be something maybe more suited to running that in, in just like a regular uh, shell command of Jenkins. Uh, it might be, you might be kind of shoehorning it if you were to use the plugin, although you probably could get the plugin to do that if it made sense for your use case. Oh, that specifically for test servers. Oh, OK. Oh, great. Oh, perfect. Thank you. OK, yeah, I've, I've really only just uh, gotten into the plugin. Cool. Yeah, so this is something uh, I haven't really toyed around with yet. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, from what I understand, it's, it's not a plugin. It's like a, a separate project. Um, and or here, let's go back here. So if you wanted to find out a bit more about it, go to our user guides. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to try to speak to it. Uh, I haven't actually used it. Um, but here's the documentation. And here's how you would actually actually use it. And I'm not trying to RTFM you. Uh, just trying to be just trying to be honest. Anything else? That's it. Well, thank you very much.